in scientific societies and communities, which is under selection, includes a uh, member of the Scientific Commission of Life Sciences, Leopoldina, Consulator of the Pontifical Council of Culture, Arquincenium, uh, Dias, BIC, owners also selection include Order of Merit, first class of the Federal Republic of Germany, Allied Prize, Dr. Honoris Causa, Rutgers University, every member of the Russian Academy of Sciences, INNS Head Award, Ashok Prize, Dr. Honoris Causa, University of Oldenburg, Hans Berger Prize, Berger rings a bell, I hope, <laughs> uh, Chevalier uh, de la Legion d'Honneur, Helmut Wies Prize, uh, different other awards. Max Planck Engineer, Planck Institute, uh, member of the German Academy of Science, Leopoldina, Zurich Prize, uh, and, uh, and uh, so on. Uh, his uh, uh, age index, according to Scopus, is 72, which is uh, 50 plus is considered Nobel class. Uh, it's 72, and ISI, it's around 90. Uh, Yearly citations are more than 2,000. Total citations are more than 25,000. Or uh, if we consider citations before uh, what Scopus began to uh, cover, uh, then of course it's, uh, it's uh, even larger. Uh, and naturally, Science, Nature, and other top tier journals are the places where his publications have been. Uh, bearing, uh, in 
multiples. Uh, last not least, uh, Paul Singer uh, heads the group of research where our doctoral student, uh, uh, our doctoral student Janaro is studying and also Renata Rotti, who has been doing some of her research there, although she's a doctoral student in, in our lab. So, again, it is a great honor to have you here. Oh, and please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Thales, for your kind words, which tell me that I'm getting old. <laughs> <laughs> this is the best summary, I guess. Um, Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Um, and thank you very much for having prepared this beautiful summer day for us. Okay, this was the least thing we were expecting when coming up to here. And I'm very glad to be here because we have been, as, as Thales just told you, uh, in contact with uh, scientists from, from Estonia. And I um, must say it was, it was a great experience to have you here and then also to have you in the lab and also to have, have had your wife in our lab. And your brother. Your brother also came back. Yeah. So um, it's, it's quite a touching experience to travel so far and, to, and then feel such uh, loneliness. It's, it's really wonderful. And I'm on the way to Taktu because there is a meeting of the German Academy for Literature and Poetry. And they all have a few scientists members. So this is why I'm here. And, uh, and I'm very much looking forward to the next few days where we will have lectures given by, uh, by your poets and novelists and uh, so we get probably some deeper insights into Estonian culture. Um, so I will essentially tell you um, what I think we, we don't know. So don't uh, expect any, any solutions to any big problems. Uh, if I succeed in giving you an impression of how complex things have become and how great the challenges will be in the future to try to understand the brain. Um, this would have been already some success. So I think we, we are facing a, a huge explanatory gap that we become aware of only now. 20 years ago, I would have thought that we are much closer to understanding how the brain works I now think we are. The reason is that <coughs> we know a great deal about the functioning of neurons, the way in which they are connected. Um, we understand some dynamics in small neuron networks on the one hand. On the other hand, we have some preliminary insights into um, functional networks that bring about cognitive and executive behavior. Thanks to non-invasive imaging technology, we now know that even relatively simple tasks involve a large number of different cortical areas that need to cooperate and that they are associated on the fly in the context of the anyway, on the backbone of the fixed anatomy from the kid. But in between, there is this huge gap. We don't understand, at least this is my position, how the interactions between neurons that form these functional networks through generating a very complex non-stationary dynamics bring about cognitive functions and executive functions. And this is where the future will have to invest heavily. And as you know, there are these big programs now that have been launched by Obama, um, where the focus is on gathering more data on the brain uh, developing technologies that allow one to get a massive panel recording with high and spatial resolution from different parts in the brain at the cellular level if possible. Study in depth the complex anatomical conditions and then trying to make sense out of it. And this human brain project that has been launched in Europe goes a completely different way. There the philosophy is we know enough, we have enough data, but they have not been put together. So what we need is massive investment into computer technology and then simulate what you know. And we will know, we will then know how the brain works if we succeed, but this would require scaling up the computer powers and the data banks. I have my own opinion, but you should decide which way is the better one at the moment. I think you like the way. Um, so 
what what caused this change in in Kerala that now defines this territory here? Um, while we were following this the very fruitful behaviorist approach, which essentially considered the brain as a, as a stimulus response machine, we were entering the brain from the sensory surfaces, and we thought that if we study in detail the transformation of the signals as they are passed on in the processing hierarchy, until we get out on the other side to the effectors and the executive structures, we will have understood how the brain works. Turn out, this was a very crucial approach. We learned a lot about the machinery, but we haven't understood how the brain works. And the reason is that in, in pursuing this research line, um, we first discovered that the connectome of the brain is far away from being simple processing streams characterized by feed forward algorithms. Um, we now realize that the brain is an extremely um, distributed system in which reciprocity and reentry prevail as organizing principles. Um, and statistical analysis of these networks tells us it's a small world network, rich club network, where every element in this network is connected to any other element through only a few nodes in the network. So communication is very distributed in parallel. And then we have learned that the brain is self-active. It's not waiting for stimuli to, to produce something. And we now understand that what we had observed already by looking at individual neurons, um, that there's enormous fluctuation in the response properties of neurons. They sometimes respond, they sometimes don't, vigorously or weak. And they also change their response properties in the context of the brain. Until quite recently, we thought that this is an expression of intrinsic noise, that the system is just not stable enough. Now we know that uh, this is by no means the case. We now know that this response variability is the consequence of the fact that the brain permanently generates very complex, high-dimensional spatial temporal patterns among many, many neurons, which reflect the complex connectivity of the brain. So these patterns contain information. They are used as templates with which the incoming sensory signals are matched, and then Conversions of those potentially generated expectancies or hypotheses or predictions with the incoming sensory information allows the brain to interpret, um, for example, um, commercial or the auditory world outside. Um, you also see that the, acti the activity patterns in the system, um, they are very close to self-organized criticality. The brain is permanently operating at the edge of chaos. It's a very interesting state of activity from where it can go into any local minimum with a very, very short latency. Um, all these are concepts that are far away from the behavioral stance that the brain is in the sports machine. And now we have to try to make sense out of this. I'll give you a few examples about the uh, small worldness of brain connectivity. So a connectome that is characterized by the fact that it is optimized to allow communication between um, neurons in different places in the brain um, with uh, very few intervening switching nodes. And it appears as if this strategy was scale free. We see it at the level of individual neurons and columns in circumscribed cortical areas. And this is an example here. If we record simultaneously for many neurons, this is done here, which can be done with this novel uh, silicon probe electrodes, and then determines the communication between the neurons by computing, for example, cross correlation functions, one gets such connectivity. It looks confusing, and one can then analyze this and order this in a different way and find out that, yeah, um, one principle of connectivity is to connect nearest neighbors. But there is also um, a strategy to have a few long range uh, connections from one node to the other um, to allow rapid communication and uh, transition from any one neuron in the local network to neurons that are integrated in other networks. So this, this occurs as 
true at the micro scale of intracortical continuum. It is also true for the uh, long range um, connections um, that characterize the cortical connectome as a whole. And what you see here is um, a selection of cortical areas in the monkey brain. And the red dots, they stand for a cytoactotonically defined cortical area. And here, only the visual areas in the monkey brain, about 30 of them, humans have about the same number, um, are, are depicted. And a few executive structures in the, in the frontal cortex, uh, which deal with the control of attention, essentially visual attention in this case. And, and these white lines, I don't know whether you can see them, but yeah, they, they, uh, they uh, stand for massive reciprocal relations between those areas. And if one analyzes the system, then you can see the, the, the mind boggling complexity of this connectivity scheme, which allows virtually unlimited communication between you and sitting down back here in any kind of visual projects and some concurrent neurons. If you know your, your underground map, it's very easy to get from here to there with one or two switching stations. And this is true for all other neurons. So it also has these uh, rich club or small worlds. And the same is true for the human brain. One can now, using uh, fusion tangent imaging or track tracing, establish uh, connectivity schemes for the human brain. And in the bottom graph, you just see a very simplified uh, connectome where we took only 120 regions, like uh, the architectonically defined regions in the brain. And uh, we only show 20% of the identifiable connections. And already this gives you. A very complex network, and you see that the two hemispheres talk to each other areas from front to back are communicating through short distances. It's also the same strategy as the scoreboard network. Now, this has a number of attractive properties. Um, it allows for, for distributed parallel processing. You can have many, more many processes um, running in different nodes at the same time. They communicate with each other in a uh, very intense way. Um, it also allows to have um, distributed processes occurring at different sites at the same time, being integrated into globally ordered states. This is something that is very much discussed in the context of the unity of consciousness. How come that you can have so many different processes running at the same time, giving auditory, visual, gustatory, what have you, senses, and then unify all this, bring the computational results together in order to get a coherent person. Mind you, right in the, in the beginning, there is no conversion center in the brain where all this information could come together to be interpreted in a coherent way. It always takes this And um, the representation of a complex polymodal object is a spatial temporal cloud of activity that involves usually both hemispheres and a large number of different areas. There is no further reduction from there it's passed on to the executive structures. So, I already said that on the backbone of this extremely complex connectivity, um, we see the formation of functional networks on the fly, which are passed to the body. So not all neurons all the time talk to each other, but there are subgroups specified which for a moment, in a past dependent way, get associated in order to produce a result. Now, this dynamic configuration of functional networks requires mechanisms of coordination. And what I shall propose is that um, the, the core mechanism for this coordination is, is temporal coordination. There seems to be no other way to achieve this but um, establish order in time. Now, there is ample evidence for temporal structure in neuronal responses. Um, you mentioned Berger. Since Berger had been known, and I just learned in Kraka last week that there is a, a pre precursor of Berger in three decades before him, uh, discovered the algorithm, the blockade of algorithm by eye opening. Um, but since he published in Polish, uh, he was completely uh, forgotten or never recognized. So 
when you publish, publish in a language that people in the United States can understand. So, um, as already Gaga has shown, there is patent, temporary patent activity in the brain. Um, we now know that um, wherever we look in the brain, we find responses that are temporary structured in the sense that they are oscillatory in various different frequency ranges. Now, if one has such temporal structure in neuronal activity, um, one can establish temporal relations because time gets passed. And um, because these are oscillatory processes, uh, phase relations become space for coding, which is very important. You can also be synchronous, and when they are synchronous, you can have them phase shifted. And in this phase uh, information, or in this phase differences, you can code information. Uh, information technicians do this all the time. This is how it looks like. <coughs> if one doesn't report the machine, but it goes into the brain, records from a bunch of neurons here in primal visual cortex, activates them with an appropriate stimulus. These cells, um, and here's a whole cluster, um, big, big spikes, big cells, or nearby cells, small, small spikes, other cells, smaller cells, or remote cells, they tend to discharge together in a rhythmic way. In this case, uh, the rhythm is about 40 hertz. And if one integrates this activity or reports low pass filter signals, one gets a local field potential that is nicely oscillatory. And of course, synchronous with these cluster discharges because the one causes the other. And such oscillatory processes are now found in all brain structures that have been looked at. Um, whereby the difference in the frequencies differ, the hippocampus is a prevailing frequency. Theta rhythm in the 7 hertz range, in the visual cortex if it's idling, it's alpha rhythm in the 10 hertz range. In the motor system, the coordinated movements are executed, it's mainly in the beta range, and uh, in local cortical circuits dealing with uh, sensory processing, the forward processing it tends to be out of the gamma, so 48 hertz outputs. The interesting phenomenon of these oscillations is of course. Uh, that they can synchronize. And this you see in this example, if one reports simultaneously from two sites in the visual cortex that are spatially segregated, one gets spatially segregated receptor fields, one can still activate those neurons with a common stimulus, and then by cross-correlating these spike discharges of those neurons, one sees, yeah, they can synchronize, they do this with close to zero face lag, so you get a strong, strong sense of peaking because of the and um, this is occurring on the basis of the oscillatory. This by itself would not be so interesting, but what makes this phenomenon really interesting is its context, context dependency. Um, the same cluster of two neurons, which under one stimulus condition, like here being activated with a long bar that sweeps over the two receptor fields, so a single contour, they synchronize, but if the very same two clusters of cells are activated by two different stimuli that move in opposite directions, so they're clearly recognizable as being separate, two different objects, then the same cells get activated, they see their stimulus locally, no change, but they no longer synchronize, suggesting that um, context, and maybe also the rules for the start um, grouping, are reflected. Uh, by the degree of synchronicity among the others. So what I will do is briefly give you some, some evidence that the precise timing of spikes relative to each other matters in the neural process. This is a new, um, a new aspect of information processing. The classical view is that all that neurons can do is signal through the rate of their discharges or the amplitude of their excitation. Uh, whether a particular feature is the case or not, it's present. What I would like to do is now to emphasize that also the precise timing of a spike relative to the other spikes is used as space for information. Um, that this precise timing is achieved through synchronization, through oscillatory patterning, and, 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 and introducing phase shifts, and phase locking as an important mechanism 
to assure selective communication between nodes and these highly distributed networks. A very important property of all these oscillatory uh, patterns is <coughs> that they are state dependent. And I will not just concentrate <coughs> on the gamma oscillations. <coughs> so these high frequency oscillations in the 40 Hertz range, they occur only when the brain is in a state of high activation, like in approximately sleep or in, when it's awake, awake and attentive. These oscillations require a cholinergic uh, modulation. So the cholinergic systems need to be highly active in order to make these phenomena um, visible. And this is always the case in arousal when the brain is expecting something, when it is attentive. And these temporal structures, they can be modified independently of discharge rate of neurons. That's very important because this gives two different spaces for coding information. You can regulate the amplitude of spike discharges, but you can also change the relative timing. And these two mechanisms are used to complement in a complementary way. Um, just to give you an example, how these oscillations can look like. Um, if uh, two neuron clusters are recorded simultaneously and then you compute the cross parallelogram with the sliding window, and they are now <coughs> put upside down, you mentioned that the central ridge here is the center peak of the cross parallelogram, and these are side peaks and the trucks here. Um, this is what you observe um, under steady state conditions in a, in a, a manual that is uh, slightly anesthetized. If you then <coughs> activate the cortex, with electrical stimulation of the principal system automation, for example, which is the arousal system, the EEG desynchronizes. But what you get is an <coughs> enhancement of these fast uh, gamma oscillations. They become more regular, the power of these oscillations increases as you can see from this peak. And if you add um, scopolamine, which is a blocker of muscarinic polymeric receptors, it's contained in belladonna. This is what uh, women used to do. They put it in their eyes, and then it uh, produces these large pupils, which is a sign of uh, Then you get rid of all these oscillations, and you can't rescue it even when you stimulate electrically the essence of the information. So there is a polynergic mechanism that favors the occurrence of these gamma oscillations. What does it do for the system? Not only does it stabilize oscillation frequency, as you can see here, the gamma oscillations, um, they become very stable um, when acetyl coding is present under conversion radiation, or when the emissions of polyphotic information is simulated as in this lower end. So the oscillations become very regular, they become stronger, but most importantly, since what the neurons do is they talk to each other with spikes, spike responses um, become much more consistent. They don't decrease in amplitude, the frequency, but they become much more reliable. There is less scatter, less noise. They become uh, confined to a narrow range of variability, as you can see here. This is baseline. But when there are nice gamma oscillations, um, the neurons uh, become very reliable with respect to their own. So it buys you something. It buys you begin with um, signal to noise improvement. Now we can also show this mechanism to be active in, in behavioral paradigms. Uh, here monkeys were trained to look at a fixation point. Then a stimulus in the receptive fields of the neurons was presented. And this stimulus was modified when the monkey had to recognize the change in the stimulus and then quickly respond in order to get the Choose reward. And the monkeys were cued to know that either would a change occur after the second stimulus or only after the third stimulus. So this allows one to direct attention uh, either to the second stimulus or to the third stimulus. And if one does so, and then measures <coughs> unit responses for local puberty, <coughs> computes again frequency spectra, not only the discharge rate. <coughs> one finds, and you will see these diagrams more often, we call them time frequency plots. You plot the frequency 
of an oscillation on the ordinate. The time of the trial runs on the abscissa. In color code, it is the strength of oscillations in terms of power. That you assume Fourier power analysis or available analysis. So what you see in this first panel um, there is always some gamma response, so this high frequency oscillation uh, in response to the first stimulus because it's attracting attention because the trial starts. Now here you see the monkey produces strong gamma oscillations in response to the second stimulus. Because the monkey was expecting due to the queuing that change would occur here. But it didn't, it was a catch trial. So the monkey maintained its attention a little bit less so. Um, so there's still gamma in response to the third stimulus because the monkey expects well then this one will have to change before it can allow it to respond. In this case, very different, the monkey expects the change to occur in response to the last stimulus. It just doesn't bother to produce any gamma oscillations in response to the first to the second stimulus. And this is a massive difference between uh, gamma power to unexpected stimuli and gamma power to expected stimuli. An interesting phenomenon here is that this dramatic change in dynamics is not reflected by changes in the discharge rate of neurons. As you can see here, the firing rates between expected and unexpected, um, uh, or firing rates to expected and unexpected stimuli are um, exactly the same. Um, this means that the oscillatory patterning of the responses and not the rate, and the associated synchronization of the discharges, because if many neurons oscillate at the same frequency, they will also discharge uh, synchrony. Um, they get enhanced by attention, by expectancy, and the readiness to act. Interesting, these are the same variables that also gave the access to conscious experience, it's, it's attention, expectancy, and readiness to do something with the stimulus. And these changes in temporal structure do not correlate with changes in discharge rate. Very often, discharge rate even goes down when the temporal structures become most salient. So there they are two orthogonal codes the nervous system can use. And I will give you an example that they are actually used in order to convey information and change the salience of stimuli. Um, you probably all know this hyperphysical phenomenon that you get enhanced apparent contrasts with, for the center grating if it is surrounded by another grating that differs in phase. If the phase offset is very strong as here, the apparent contrast of the center grating is higher than here where the phase offset is smaller. And you get the same effect when you um, increase orientation contrast between the center grating and the outer grating by turning the outer grating away from the orientation of the center grating. Now we can now study the responses of neurons in primary visual cortex uh, under these conditions. And here's the psychophysical function for the phase offset increase in apparent brightness that hadn't been done before. It hadn't been done for orientation offset, but this is the curve for the phase offset enhancement of apparent contrast. And you see it's a very nice smooth function um, where the contrast increases maximally when the phase offset is What one then can do is insert electrodes in the cortex with multi-site uh, hotspots and record from a large number of neurons that respond to the center grating, or we can also record across those boundaries, and then study the neuron responses. This year is confirmatory. It has been done already before. People recorded from neurons responding to the center grating and they found, as we did, if you rotate away the outer grating increasingly from the orientation of the inner grating leading to enhanced contrast, discharge rates increase. This is due to the decreasing lateral inhibition uh, between cortical columns of different orientation. So far the world seems to be fine. The surprise came when we did the same by increasing contrast with the uh, phase offset. And you see there's no change in discharge rate. Now this raises the problem, how does the cortex increase the saliency of the responses if it doesn't increase the discharge rate of neurons? The answer is here. Since we have more than one unit recorded at the same time, we could compute cross-correlations between the neurons. 
responding to the center gradient, um, and determine from the peak amplitude of the center peak the amount of coincident or synchronous firing that increases over here. And take this measure rather than the discharge rate, so the changes in synchrony, and see how that changes as a function of these two different ways to increase contrast. And to our surprise, when we increase contrast with orientation also, um, there was no change in discharge rate. I know it, uh, in co correlation, <laughs> coincidence high. It dropped a little bit when the other gradient appeared, but then it didn't change as a function of orientation offset. But when contrast was enhanced by phase offset, there is this beautiful match between the neural responses and the cytophysical curve, suggesting that the cortex can use two different strategies to increase the saliency of responses. One is to increase the discharge rate, and it uses this strategy in order to increase the, the, the apparent contrast here. And in case of phase offset, it can't use this orientation-dependent increase of inhibition. It uses synchrony as the way to enhance the saliency of responses. Because mind you, <coughs> synchronous discharges of neurons are uh, or to making, making neurons fire synchronously. It increases the impact they can have on postsynaptic target cells because postsynaptic cells um, respond much more likely to coincident synaptic input than to temporary dispersed synaptic input because of nonlinear summation properties of dendrites. So the bottom line is that apparently the nervous system can use two strategies to increase the saliency of responses. Either it increase, increases discharge rate of the neural neurons or it decreases the symptom. And the effect is perceptually indistinguishable because contrast enhancement is the same. I won't talk about the option. And now we'd like to give you two, two lines of evidence that a spike is not just a spike. It matters when exactly it occurs. And uh, this is something the nervous system is most likely utilizing in order to encode its interesting information in addition to um, the amplitude of discharge. Strategies are always the same when you use high tech electrodes that allow one to record from many sites simultaneously, sample activity, and what one sees in this case is that um, recording from visual cortex a bunch of neurons, and here five are shown. Um, here is the, uh, the gamma oscillation that is recorded with an independent field electrode at the same time. It's as regular as or irregular as biological signals tend to be. And then you see that there's when this stimulus is passing over the receptor fields of those neurons, um, there is some sequence regularity in the firing. This neuron always tends to fire ahead of that neuron. And this seems to be quite consistent for a particular stimulus configuration. And the same is true for the other cells. So what one can do is one can run cross correlograms between all possible pairs of cells and find out which cell is firing in front of which cell by which amount of time given a particular stimulus. And by doing so, um, using the center peak offset as the relative offset of the fine, the third fine. And if one does this, one finds that these delays are additive. If neuron A is firing 1.4 milliseconds before B and B 2.3 before C, then A is firing uh, the sum of 3.8 before C. So very, very consistent temporal relations between the relative firing times of those neurons. The question now is, is there some information in these relative firing times? And remind you, this, this staggering of firing occurs within a single gamma cycle. So gamma cycle lasts 25 milliseconds. So within 25 milliseconds, the sequence is defined. So does it contain information? First question one asks is, of course, are these sequences consistent? And um, so what one can do is one can align the neurons around the virtual zero as the ones firing earlier and the ones firing earlier and the ones firing later. So here you see a whole bunch of neurons producing such a sequence. And then do this with, uh, in this case, seven hours uh, interval, um, hoping to have the same neurons in the electrodes, which in most cases is true, except I think for the other one, that may have been a new one. 
But you see, on the whole, after seven hours, the firing sequence is still very, very much the same. If the stimulus is the same, the drifting rate in the orientation follows. If one changes the drift direction downwards, the whole firing sequence changes. So you see that there is some information in the firing sequence that tells one, at least the observer, um, something about the stimulus. And so we set out to calculate the amount of information contained in this firing sequence um, with respect to the stimulus. Can you predict the stimulus from knowing the firing sequence? What one classically does is one counts the number of spikes in the, in the response and then computes tuning curves and then infers on the nature of the stimulus. This is shown up here. If one does it with discharge rate, one gets a uh, set of field configurations and the mutual information is 0.2, so one can predict fairly well from the spike rates what the stimulus was. One can also do this using firing times, using these sequences, and you see that the predictability is similarly high. So there is as much information retrievable from these precise firing sequences as there is from the discharge rate of the nerves. Except that in order to evaluate the discharge rate, we need to have a long integration window because within 25 milliseconds, uh, you can have only one spike maximum, two spikes are reported in neuron. So we have to wait until we know how active that neuron is. Not so with the firing sequences. They can be read out with a single cycle because they are constituted in a single cycle. And this may be necessary because um, there are theoretical considerations by people like Simon Thorpe, for example, in psychophysics tells us this since, since ever, that you have about, assuming that there is some serial processing of visual stimuli in the, in the visual processing hierarchy, that you have about 25 milliseconds for V1 in order to compute the result, to tell you what the stimulus configuration is, what belongs to finger, what belongs to gun, which allows cells in V1 to emit maybe one, two, maximum three spikes if they burst. There is no, not much more they can say in this short window, given their rate of activity. So if one wants to read out uh, quickly uh, what the case is, then um, these firing sequences would be much more suitable because they can be decoded very, very well. In fact, within a single oscillation cycle. Another example for um, spikes, not just being spikes. What we usually do is, when we compute the orientation sensitivity of a cortical neuron, we sample spikes uh, for different stimuli, uh, plot the total number of spikes occurring in a large window, long window, and then we end up with the orientation sensitivity index of that kind. What one can also do is, one can, if one has an oscillatory process underlying, take one of these gamma cycles and take only the spikes which occur at a particular phase of the cycle. Right. Only the spikes which are here, or only the spikes which are here. And then compute the tuning curves for those spikes only. And then it turns out there are spikes that occur at a particular phase angle, indicated by red here, that have a very, very precise tuning while spikes that are out here show very lousy tuning. If one takes all spikes, tuning is bad. If one takes only the few spikes that occur at a particular phase angle, one gets very sharp tuning. So the information contained in individual spikes, even in terms of their rate, differs as a function of their phase angle relative to the ongoing oscillation. So a system that wants to extract the maximum of information would be well advised if it limits its application or the processing only to spikes that occur at a particular phase in. Now the question is, can this be done? Is there a mechanism to do this? Um, and uh, you will see, yes, there is. And this is a mechanism that can probably solve two, two problems at the same time. Once it can, among many spikes that are offered, select only a few for further processing. And then it can be used to selectively funnel activity in this highly interconnected system 
to root activity selectively between nodes. And the uh, hypothesis goes as follows. If one records from two clusters of cells or from two nodes, one sees that when they engage in oscillatory activity, um, and even if they get into the same, and train into the same frequency, this very large band, they can um, oscillate in synchrony, but they shift their phases all the time. And if one plots all the phase angles that one observes after, after a minute of recording or so, one sees that the system explores the whole phase space. All phase relations occur at some moment in time. But there are some preferred phase relations. And now I need a little bit of, of background. Um, when a neuron cluster gets engaged in an oscillatory process, especially when it's high frequency oscillation in the gamma range, cells go through a short epoch in the peak of the oscillation where they are very susceptible to synaptic input and where they can produce spikes. In this short window of opportunity is followed by the trough of the oscillation and in here, in this trough, there is massive firing, burst firing of inhibitory interneurons, membrane is shunted, membrane resistance is low, EPSPs become very small, and some are virtually not. So if input arrives in this phase, the cell will not listen to it, will not be able to respond, it cannot be that. While input that comes at that very moment will be very, very effective. So you can imagine if two cells that are interconnected reciprocally fire in synchrony being entrained in the same oscillation frequency, the phase angles being adjusted such, taking into consideration some production time, that what this neuron says in terms of firing is hitting this neuron at the, in the window of maximal opportunity and vice versa. And these two clusters can communicate very effectively. While another group of neurons also interconnected, maybe to the same extent with fibers, uh, if it happens to oscillate in counterphase, it will always be in the refractory period when this one here sends. And while this one sends a message, this one will be refractory. So they can't communicate. So this is a very versatile mechanism to gate communication between nodes on the fly, because these phase angles can be shifted very quickly, to open and close communication channels. And the question is, does this really occur? And the evidence is yes. The, the way one does this is one records simultaneously from two nodes, two classes of cells, determines the communication between the two cells, either by computing mutual information between the respective spike trains or by um, measuring some other covariance variable, and plot this intensity of communication or reliability of communication in color for the different oscillation frequencies that we can measure. Because remember, there's always broad band that oscillations are nested, they occur in different frequencies. And then one finds very consistently that communication among neuron clusters becomes the strongest when they engage in a particular phase angle oscillation. We call it just the good phase. It need not be zero phase, it depends on production velocity. And, um, this is found equally in uh, the striped cortex of cats, in the primary visual cortex of the lake monkeys, and in, in the V4, which is a pre striped area in the lake monkeys. It always occurs in the, in the, in the gamma frequency range. Uh, this seems to be the, the frequency that is particularly suitable for gating of this communication um, because of the, of the fast. Uh, at the high frequency which narrows this peak of opportunity. The faster the oscillation, the narrower this, this window of susceptibility gets. So there is a mechanism that allows to select among many spikes in neuron generals and the many spikes that other neuron generals in the brain, those which a neuron should expect or accept for further processing that can be used select among the spike trains of individual neurons or in subsets, and to open and close communication channels on the fly in a very uh, adaptive way. 
And there's evidence that this is actually used for the cons configuration of functional networks. So coupling can be modified dynamically. Um, this allows for selective routing of signals in an attention dependent way. We now know that attention gets gamma rhythms, so this seems to be using this mechanism. And um, it allows to establish transient relations between nodes. These nodes are always connected to each other, but whether they can talk to each other or not depends on the relative phase of their oscillations. So, just to close, one can, of course, use the analysis of coherence for the identification of functional networks that configure on the backbone of fixed and dynamic connections. We can use this for the analysis of processes in normal brains, um, the definition of default networks, or the definition of functional networks in the context of particular tasks. But we can also use it in order to see whether brains and states of disease differ from normal brains. So these are like a few examples. We use this um, hypothesis in order to investigate brains of schizophrenic patients for the simple reason that schizophrenia is characterized by the fact that these um, patients have problems um, to appropriately group together what should be connected and to keep separate what should be kept separate. They establish bindings between semantic contents that normally do not bind together and likewise they cannot put together what should be put together. So they seem to have a binding problem and um, if binding means establish a function networks, bind nodes together by opening communication channels, that should be reflected in changes in coherence. So they were given a cognitive task, it was simple, to see whether this is a phase or not. These were known like the movie phases. That requires a lot of filling in, that requires a lot of selective binding between contours in order to see a phase, and then there were other patterns where it was impossible to recognize a phase because they were upside down and scrambled. And all the subjects had to do is press button face or press button no face. We did MEG recording, time frequency analysis. Um, here's an example of, of source localizations and, and the activities occurred or with respect them to occur in the early phases of the, um, of the task over the visual cortex. Um, and the of the brain. Then we found such as time frequency analysis, which is that controls produce um, a lot of gamma activity uh, right after stimulus presentation. They maintain a gamma band. There is also activity in the lower frequency bands all the way down to theta. Um, and then um, this is the response period where they have recognized and do something. And one sees already in, in schizophrenic patients there is less power in this frequency band. And this is not uh, due to medic medication, medication only, because we also see this decrease uh, in first episode non-treated uh, young patients. Um, the difference is larger in the chronic schizophrenics, uh, but for sure some of this difference is not medication induced, which is always a problem in clinical studies. I think more conspicuous than amplitude changes are uh, changes in phase synchrony uh, between quarterly areas. So here we measured not the amplitude of the oscillations in the particular frequency band, but the precision of synchronization of these oscillations taken from different sites in the brain. And what you see here is a normal subject. Now in the beta range, these long range synchronization events, they occur preferentially in, in the lower frequency band, in the beta, which is 15 to uh, right after stimulus presentation, uh, there is a massive increase in phase locking of these beta oscillations in the two parts, and this is virtually missing in these schizophrenic patients. It's a very dramatic difference. And this difference correlates <coughs> quite significantly with the uh, severity of the clinical syndromes that has been um, assessed by the clinicians in the We can then 
analyze this statistically and put up graphs of connections that uh, show significant phase locking, some threshold somewhere. Then you get this picture in normal subjects. So you see again that large quantum network is involved in this relatively simple task. Uh, and this is much less so this threshold level of schizophrenia patients, suggesting that this imprecise synchronization might be a cause for the dissociative symptoms in this disease, um, the rest of this task. And, and to really close, I would like to mention briefly developmental data that the analysis were motivated by the fact that schizophrenia manifests itself for the first time um, at around uh, late adolescence, early adult, a little bit earlier in men than in women, and in women there is a second period of susceptibility around the menopause. So why is it that this disease peaks here and starts here for the So we did a developmental study. Um, taking groups from six-year-old kids all the way up to 21-year adults and studied again uh, with moody phase, with parallel uh, oscillations in phase locking. And with respect to the gamma oscillations, we see there is a steady increase uh, of gamma oscillations with age, so the world seemed in order. They become more and more prominent. And the same is, to, is the case for theta oscillations. I have no slide for that. But a surprise comes if one looks at the phase locking data. Um, phase locking also increases with age in the beginning. And you see this here. Uh, this is the late childhood uh, of phase locking. And this is the adult. So late childhood seems already on, on a good way to become adult. But in late adolescence, all this beauty breaks down again. It's no longer there. Looks as bad as it's schizophrenia. So phase locking in the beta range increases, breaks down, and then reconfigures and becomes a dark one. And this reconfiguration goes along with the dramatic reconfiguration of functional networks. There is a diffuse network in the beginning that uh, shows increasingly good phase locking, which then disappears and reconfigures, but now becomes much more focal in, in the other. Um, so little is understood with respect to all those things that occur. What it tells us is that there is late in human development. It's a phase of reorganization that is dramatic, that goes along with the strong change in the dynamic properties of the networks. It is expressed by a transient disappearance of precise phase of the data frequency. This study has triggered reanalysis of monkey data because no work has been available on late developmental stages. All the, the critical period research is usually done early on in life uh, because this is where one thinks that cortex is adaptive and that all these important environmental modifications can be in place. Here's an, another late phase, actually known already by Freud. Uh, he called this uh, second chance. He said if you miss the first critical period, here is a window of susceptibility, and you put it in about the same age range uh, where you can uh, recover functions that have not been established early on. Now, this monkey work now shows that, that as late in development, the uh, monkey is about 10 times faster, so one has to scale of this. There is still a change of receptor subunits for the GABA A receptor, something that one had expected to occur early on in development known that there the NMDA receptor changes subunits uh, from subunits that make the channel have slow kinetics to a channel that has fast kinetics. Now something similar, the exchange of alpha 2 to alpha 1 receptor subunit of the GABA A channels of the inhibitory channel, the various inhibitory interactions, occurs that late in development and makes that the inhibitory events become much faster in time, better time, which may be the reason for the higher precision um, of, of dark networks, faster oscillations, better synchronization. And there are many other changes occurring that way. Myelination is still changing, um, the 
duration between white matter and gray matter is still changing. So um, more research should be done in this late phase of human development because there are still uh, massive changes occurring. Um, with this, I would like to stop. Noon time, lunch time. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, now we have time for questions, of course. So please look forward. Yes. Um, I, my question, I, I might have missed it in the beginning, but what exactly oscillates? Ah. So what you see is when you record from a neuron in spikes, that these spikes occur in, in clusters separated by intervals, where they don't spike. So if you run an autocorrelation, you see an oscillation. You, see, you also see it if you just look at the kill potential, which is a, the sum of all the synaptic currents in the, in the region, um, and then you see an oscillatory potential, like you see in the region. Now the mechanism behind this, <coughs> multiple mechanisms, but the one that generates the gamma rate in the past is are reciprocal interactions between local inhibitory interneurons. They are coupled through electrical synapses, and they are coupled reciprocally through GABAergic synapses. And this network by itself, if you activate it, engages into these fast oscillations. And the frequency is determined by the kinetics of the membrane um, conductance and by the time constants of the um, IPSP currents. It's gamma A. It's fast. When integrated in the cortical network, an additional element comes, which are reciprocal connections between the gramman cells and this inhibitory network. So the gramman cells, assume they are spontaneously active, they feed into this inhibitory network. The inhibitory network paces this activity feeds back periodically IPSPs, which block the neuronal cells, and this makes a local oscillator. Now you want to propagate these oscillations to other areas, or synchronize other areas. This is done, I should say, differently. You have, in each area, you have these local oscillators, so they can do their oscillation business locally, but they can also synchronize it. And this is done through the long range excitatory connections that pass um, within the cortical area through the superficial layers, and between cortical areas they go to right now, or through the corpus callosum. And these two dramaturgical fibers, they impinge in their target zones, both onto inhibitory interneurons and the pyramidal cells. And these connections are usually reciprocal. And this makes the Remote oscillators can synchronize. And now comes comes a mystery. They can synchronize the zero phase length, even though there is a considerable conduction delay um, between the two areas, which at first sight seems impossible, violating the rules of well, basic laws. It is now known that it can be done um, because of the properties of nonlinear dynamical systems. And the solution came from laser physics. Laser physicists saw these data. He had shown that there is zero phase like synchrony between the two hemispheres. And they said, that, you know, this is possible. Said, yeah, but we found it and we cut the corpus callosum, and it's gone, so it must be this reciprocal correction. We will show you that can't be. They put two lasers uh, semiconductor lasers, and sh shun the light of the two lasers into each other, so they, they get reciprocally coupled. And it just so happens that the oscillation frequency of these lasers and light speed have about the same relation as gamma oscillations and production losses. And the outcome was, as predicted, those lasers would never synchronize. They would stumble and produce very chaotic stuff. And then one of the PhD students in this lab, this happened in Mallorca, um, put a third laser crystal in the middle. And all of a sudden, the other lasers were face synchronous, 
in the Middle Ages did something very, very weird. It took them a year to find an analytical solution for this phenomenon. It's now robust, it's published, it's great excitement. It can be done. And it, is, it can always be done when you have three parties. You need, you need a triangular uh, constellation of, in the network. And it always works. And then you can get zero phase length synchronization over large distances irrespective of conductive times. Um, that's how it is. And it has recently been simulated with close to realistic neural networks as much as you can do it. And it also seems to work if you just have integrated fire neurons put into networks, and they do it. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Other questions, yes, please. Hi, thanks, it's very nice. So we need Tama power to use the phase information, but it was missing in nine to 11 year olds. How, were, how are they finding the information, or are they all schizophrenics? Well, <laughs> <coughs> they have it, but, but they're, they're, the, the amplitude is much, much lower. Uh, you also have it in, in, in babies. They, they can do gamma, but they do it in bouts. Um, it's much more variable, so if you run those, those plots, uh, it's more difficult to get significant peaks. Um, it's there. In, in general, the rule is that the faster they are, these oscillations, the more precise can the timing be. You could probably play the whole game also with, with, with data. If the compass does do it, apparently. Not in all species, and that turns out the bats don't have it, primates don't have it in hippocampus, as likely as rodents, it seems to be a specific thing. If they are slower, uh, the windows of opportunity get larger, um, so you, you are less precise, you can't respond as fast, um, can pack not as, not as much information into the cycle. Um, so you, you can play this game at all different frequencies. If you want to be precise and information rich, uh, it's good to be as fast as you can, but there's an upper limit because the membrane, membrane time constants and for the oscillation generating mechanism, the conduction time is better. So perhaps uh, gamma is not NCC but NCC PR, perhaps if one year old has consciousness, but no uh, gamma. Well, I wouldn't say that they have no gamma. Um, okay. The data from that um, April Benasic produces the drug test clearly show that they do have it. They are attentive, and if they in the preferential looking past, they have it. The frequencies are slightly lower. Uh, the phase locking isn't as good, but they can do it. But, but from the psychophysics side of view, mental phenomena have temporal resolution, let's say 10 hertz, 20 hertz max. Uh, but the uh, phase differences between spikes are one, two, three milliseconds. So uh, perhaps this suggests that uh, individual phase relations between the spikes are related to NCCPR, but not as NCC proper. Well, I, mean, I wish I knew what NCC is. <laughs> um, the the phenomenology we see at the outside may not at all be what happens in the brain. Because we measure a lot of linear functions and uh, the categorization seems to occur according to, to linear principles. But we have all evidence that what happens in the brain is, is highly nonlinear, high dimensional. And so the cortex may apply algorithms for its computations. They do not show up on the executive side. So it's only a part of the story, not the whole story. Come on, secret. Well, this is just one frequency band that we stumbled on and then worked on it. But there is, of course, there is higher frequencies. We don't know whether they are function relevant, but in the pumps you have this 200 Hz ripple. Um, and there are these many, many lower frequencies. And they are certainly playing a role. Um, I just got a recent uh, report, I think I can talk about it, this from Lucia, uh, who was mentoring uh, West a Western colleague, who works now in New York, uh, and she's collaborating with David Purple, 
he is in the oratory system. And um, he combined uh, psychophysics with electrophysics. Like he wasn't you, because he was an ancient president. They find that when they offer subjects a sequence of uh, phonemes, which, because of the frequency of co-occurrence, after a while, form gestalts, i.e. words, in, in the recognition of these subjects. In the beginning, it's just chaos. It's just following uh, phonemes. But if a certain sequence of phonemes is consistently repeated, you start to interpret this as a, as, as a chunk. You chunk it as a word. You know, it means nothing. And what they find is that the oscillations in the auditory cortex, in the beginning, um, they just mimic the sequence of phonemes. And once this chunking process, which is a purely internal uh, mental process, converges to its chunking some of these syllable sequences or phoneme sequences into a unit, they become the basis. So the rhythm all of a sudden gets scaled down, um, and, and sometimes both rhythms coexist, to get a new rhythm that reflects this bigger chunk. And probably the same happens uh, everywhere. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Uh, it, yes. Yeah, I just want to hear your take on the on this very simple proposal that that the slower the frequency, the larger the, the network. Uh, but, but you showed the data where, where gamma is involved in quite relatively quite large scale network. Well, the, the two graphs when it became long distance was always data. Ah, okay. Um, I think there is something in it. Gamma is this local processing, and you can synchronize gamma islands over fairly long distances, but to produce the meta network into which those are integrated, it's usually done by downscaling the frequency. And uh, we see, for example, during uh, working memory tasks, and this we have seen both in human and in monkey, that in the whole period, you have gamma bursts occurring over prefrontal cortex. But they occur in a theta rhythm. And uh, this theta rhythm seems to be reset because you can average across sessions, average even across subjects, by the presentation of the, the sample stimulus. So there seems to be a theta rhythm triggered on which the gamma bouts ride. Uh, and there may be more rhythms nested into each other. And a huge discussion to uh, talk to Jan, who had a paper on the difficulty. It is still no, no, it's not yet published. Right? It's still in the rebuttal process of the problem of cross frequency coupling. It is, of course, a very interesting topic because it would allow one to express message relations. And this is so utterly important, and there is no good solution for it yet in the network theory. But phase coupling and uh, cross-frequency coupling would be a, a way out. Yes, in one study, you found that uh, there was uh, about equal amount of information from, from timing and from, uh, from uh, firing rates. Did you study whether this information was overlapping or correlated or not, or if you sound together this information, is it uh, two times more information or not? Um, this was what one referee had also asked us to do. <laughs> um, they are what you were not the referee, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, we haven't done it so far because the, it's, it's difficult to um, to use these two orthogonal codes. We don't quite know whether we should just summate the evidence or um, we just know there is similar amount of evidence in the sequence as there is in, in the discharge rate. Um, as you saw, the tuning curves, they look different with respect to the orientation preference of the neurons. But we don't know how the brain uses these sequences. Um, so we don't know quite which measure we should extract from them. We just took one, which was uh, sequence order. But we could also use the relative timing, which we didn't. We just 
to the city as well. Um, if, if you have a good suggestion of how one can combine those two measures to find out whether if one used both, one would know more about the students, tell me. <laughs> or publish it yourself. <laughs> 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 or take our data, yeah. They are, uh, they are really available. I have a related question, uh, or remote uh, related. Uh, I have overlooked when reading uh, all this stuff. Uh, uh, what uh, is the relation between the so-called good phase of a spike and the surface measured negativity? Is there any relation or, or no? I mean, uh, are there preferable <coughs> phases where uh, spikes uh, uh, are produced in implants related more to the uh, surface uh, recorded negativity or, uh, or uh, there is no data about? There are very few data that really would allow one to, to cross those scales. Local spikes, local free potentials are okay, but the negativity is the usual pile during the negativity. But even there, there may be problems. Um, if, if, if you are recording between layers where the, the phase reversal occurs, it may also be that you see the field potential from here and the spike from here, and uh, when it, it reverses its yeah, Especially the of the yeah. vortex. Yeah. And um, there is no correlation attempted yet with the surface data, because they would really have to have micro <coughs> the field potential, hopefully across layers, an ECOC on top of the cortex and an EG electrode outside. And we see how all these relate to each other. That has to be done. So Nikos Logopathis has some stuff where they measure on surface, EG, and the really multi-unit activity, and they look at their phase uh, uh, relationships between these two. So it's emerging. And of course, it's somatic processes and dendritic processes may <coughs> have a little bit of different impact. Let's say if you measure spiking rates uh, and somatic, uh, 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 let's say, sodium-related uh, processes and calcium spikes are more important relative to dendritic processes and makes another level of complexity. Yeah. Yeah. If you think about the layer 5 cells in the large pyramids, you record the spikes from down in Soma, and um, the decisive events may happen in layer 1 at the, at the tufts. If they produce calcium spikes, that would be a huge electrographic event, which you see in the e on the surface. Um, this hasn't been done properly yet. All we know is surface negativity is related to more activity in the, in the brain, but this is potassium. Okay, questions? I think I have to work. Uh, <laughs> one. Uh,